Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. Sometimes we put levels of sin. Sin, sin. And if it's something that the Holy Spirit's dealing with us about, it might be about food. Uh, <laughs> something Rusty and I have dealt with. We're, we're working on our, our self-discipline, our self-control. I believe it's a part of our Christian walk to walk in that self-control and self-discipline. And I, I can't tell you not to go overboard on, on some what people would call big thing if I don't have control over food. So it may be over anger. I don't know what your temptations are. Strife. But whatever they are, God has a proven way to beat it. An absolute proven way to beat it. So I think, first of all, we need to understand why God hates sin. It's, it's not that he's just up there with lightning bolts uh, looking to, to flash something at somebody when they mess up. God hates sin because of love. And what sin does and what sin did, you can go ahead and be turning to Genesis 2 because we're going to go there and look at the original sin on earth. What sin does is separates God from who he loves. That's why he hates it. He doesn't hate it for no other reason. It's because it separates you from, from him. And so no matter what that sin is, you know, the, the closer we, we walk with God, the more picky we get about our lives. And that shouldn't be a bad thing. We should want to be holy because he's holy. Because we love him. Because the more we see him, the more we want to be like him. The scripture tells us to be imitators of him as dear children. And if you've ever watched a kid, they want, they want to be like dad. Uh, they want to be like mom. And that's the way we should want to be. So let's go back to Genesis 2. I'm going to do a little bit of reading here. And I don't think I put it all in your notes because I couldn't fit it all in there. But I'm reading to you out of the NIV. In Genesis 2, 16, man's in the garden. God's created this perfect, almost perfect environment for him and placed him there. And, and I love to bring this out because I think it's important. So many of us, we, we have a, a human habit, which we'll see here in Genesis from the very beginning, from the beginning of humanity. We've had this habit of wanting to blame our sin on something, anything, somebody, something that happened. And so here's Adam and Eve in this near perfect environment. The only thing that could go wrong was there was a tempter, there was a liar, there was a thief in the garden. Everything else was perfect. They, had, they walked and talked with God in the cool of the day. They were in a beautiful environment. There wasn't like environmental issues going on. Everything, what is it all the politicians argue about? There, there, there wasn't any global warming going on causing any issues. It was perfect. And yet, they sinned. So life can be near perfect, and us still mess up. And I think it's important for us to realize that. So anyway, Genesis 2, 16. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free. You're free to eat from any tree in the garden. We're talking about a whole garden of trees here. Now this just shows you, once again, human nature. You can have any fruit from any tree out here, but don't eat this one or you're going to die. What does man want? The one that he can't have. <laughs> and, and so God's real up front with man. He, he says, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Some versions say, in dying you shall die. Because he would die spiritually. He'd be disconnected from his life source, which was God. He would continue to to live on the earth, but death would start its course. All right, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made, and he said to the woman, this is the serpent speaking here, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? This is the way the stupid guy works. It, you know, it just almost always starts with a question. Is, that really gonna, is it really going to hurt if you do that? Is that really a sin? You know, the apostle was very plain. Some things are wrong that aren't sin. 
but they're wrong for you. And so we have to know what is right and wrong in our lives and why. It's always because of love. Did you really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You know, she, she added a little bit to what God said. So Satan right there knew she's not real sure about what God said. If you're not real sure about what God said to you, you can be misled. We can fall for something that's not true if we don't understand what God said to us. Verse 4. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of them both were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together. That just always cracks me up. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? See, God expects a relationship with you. He expects you to respond to his voice and to his coming. And when you don't, he knows something's wrong. And his love for you is what hates sin. Because look at what sin did to man. It separated them from their life source. And they started trying to handle it themselves. Sew fig leaves together, really? Have y'all ever tried to sew leaves together? They're going to try to cover up what they've done, and they're going to try to hide what they've done from God. And the more they do that, the more God knows what's happened. So the man and his wife, when they heard the sound, God said, where are you? Verse 10, he answered, I heard you in the garden. This is man speaking. And I was afraid. Oh, stinking on it. Here we've had the walk and the talk and the relationship with a loving father, with the God, the one who created us, who put all these beautiful things in the earth for us. And now, because of sin, we're hiding ourselves from our very own life source, and we are afraid to approach him. That's what sin does, makes us afraid to approach. We're going to get rid of that tonight. And he said, God said, who told you you were naked? You know what God knew at that moment? They had been listening to another voice other than his. He created them. He created you. He knows who you are. We sang that song this morning. I love that song. He knows my name. He knows my makeup. He knows who I truly am. And other voices come in and start trying to say who you are or what you are. That's partaking of fruit that is off limits. God's, God's my voice. He's my source. He's the one we need to find our identity from. The man said, it's the woman you put here with me. So immediately here goes the fingers. She gave me some fruit, so I ate it. The man said, it was the woman, and then the Lord looked at the woman, and he said, what is this you've done? And the woman said, it was the serpent. It was the serpent. He deceived me, and so I ate. And so here goes the fault of humanity, blaming everybody else for what they just did when it was clearly a choice. And God, look, God is an upfront God. He will never lie to you. If it will kill you, he will tell you it will kill you. It's not him cursing you. It's him warning you of what will happen if you serve a cursed God. We can either serve the God of life or we can serve the God of death. And so he makes it very plain to us. In fact, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin are... Deuteronomy 30, 19, God says, I've set before you life and death. And then he gives you this open book test. I've put before you life and death. Choose life. 
Why? So that you and your seed may live. So it's not just our choices just influencing us. Our choices, our choices influence generations, and he tells us that ahead of time. He's an upfront God. He doesn't want us to be deceived. He wants us to know the truth. If you eat of this fruit, you're going to start to die. You're going to be separated from your life source. You're going to start to die. He's always honest with us. God did not tempt man. I hear a lot of people blaming God and saying, well, why did he put the tree in the garden? Why did he put the tree in the garden if he knew they could, they could eat it? God gave us this beautiful thing called free choice. And he's the kind of father that wants his children to love him by choice and not by force. And when we, we choose him, that's a beautiful, powerful thing. We had somebody choose him this morning, by the way. You have a new brother in the body of Christ. God did not tempt man with it. He didn't set it out there to tempt man. Go with me to James 1. I think this is a very important point for people to understand because, you know, religion, when I say religion, I'm not talking about Christianity. Y'all don't know me quite as well as these people. So when I talk about religion, I'm talking about anything but Christianity because Christianity to me is not a religion. It's life. It's a lifestyle. And so religion a lot of times blames God and really twists things and, and makes people think that God put this temptation out there to test them. I, I think God's smarter than that. Just to test people? So I think James 1 clears that up really well. James 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. There's a great reward for enduring. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. That, I don't know how much plainer we can say that. Don't let somebody say it. If they say it, say, whoa, wait a minute, take them to this scripture because if you think God's doing it to you, it takes some fight out of you. And, and, and we're supposed to win this. We're supposed to endure this. We're supposed to outlast this temptation. So don't let anybody say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. He will not put something in front of you to, to see if you will fail. He will not. It's not in him. It's not possible. He is love. I, wouldn't, I would not set a trap for my children for my grandbabies set a trap for them and, and to see if I can watch them fail no way I'm going to do everything I can to set a path before them for them to succeed and if I feel that way as a, as a human being how much better is the good good father amen Here's, here's the kicker, verse 14. God's up front with us. Here's the truth. Each one of us is tempted when we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. That's kind of tough. But I'd rather him be tough and honest with me so that I know what I'm up against. I'm up against myself. Then when desires have conceived, they give birth to sin and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So there is a progression to this, and this lets me know that I need to stop temptation before it goes any further. When it's just a desire, I need to get it handled. Because once that desire is conceived, then it will become a sin. And to me, that conceived is when I take that thought, I choose it, I choose to take that fruit, and make it my own. And when I do that, then it becomes a sin. Just being tempted is not a sin, folks. Being tempted is not a sin. That's life. If it's when that sin is conceived, we choose it, that it becomes, gives birth to sin, and then sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Verse 16, don't be deceived. My beloved brethren, he's speaking this out of love. Every good gift, and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of 
lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. I wrote in my, my notes, God is not shady. There's no variation. He is light. There is no variation in him at all. He's not shady. He's not set us, going out to set us up for failure. That would be shady to me. That's the way he described the devil in Genesis. Crafty and cunning and subtle and sneaky. That's not God. He's upfront God. That's for somebody. He's up front with you. Why? Because he loves you. He wants us to see the traps that are in front of us because he doesn't want us to fall into them. In fact, he's, all, he's already provided a proven way for you to escape temptation. It's already laid out for us. We had a great example, didn't we, in Jesus. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture tonight, but... That's what we do. There's not an anointing on my opinion, but there is an anointing on the word. That's what destroys the yoke of bondage. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. I'm going to read this to you out of the Amplified. And if you wonder why I use a different version every now and then, not everybody's churched. Not everybody uh, grew up speaking King James. By the way, the Bible was not written in King James anyway. And I don't speak Greek, so Hebrew or Greek. So uh, I use it sometimes because it gives a little definitions to words that we might not use anymore in our everyday language. So 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, out of the Amplified, says, Now these things befell them by way of a figure as an example and warning to us. So examples were given in the Scripture for an example and a warning to us, they were written to admonish and to fit us for right action by good instruction. We in whose days the ages have reached their climax. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands, who feels sure that he has a steadfast mind and is standing firm, take heed lest he fall into sin. So we, you know, the scripture's full of, of God telling us, be sober-minded. Be alert, be aware, lest you fall into temptation. He, he wants us to be sharp. He don't, want us, he don't want us to fall into a fool's trap. He wants us to be totally aware of what's laid out for us. For no temptation, no trial regarded as enticing to sin, no matter how it comes or where it leads, no temptation has overtaken you and laid hold on you that is not common to man. You know what the enemy, the devil, wants you to think? That you're out there alone. That you're the only one who's having these thoughts. You're the only one who's dealing with this. That's a lie. There's no temptation that's, over, that's taken man that's not common to man. There's no supernatural temptation. He can only approach us through our flesh. That's it. My spirit's sealed by the Holy Spirit. I'm protected there because I've accepted Jesus as Lord. My spirit's protected. He can only approach me through my flesh. What's common to man? That is, no temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance and that is not adjusted and adapted and belonging to human experience and such as a man can bear. But God is faithful. I love that. God is faithful to his word and to his compassionate nature. This is who he is. He can't help it. He loves you. And he is faithful to that nature. And he can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried and assayed beyond your ability and strength of resistance and power to endure. But with the temptation, he will always also provide the way out, the means of escape to a landing place, that you may be capable and strong and powerful to bear up under it patiently. Which sometimes we've got to have a little patience with ourselves, right? When we're enduring things. But I, I can't get over this. I have it highlighted in my notes. He's faithful to you. 
He's faithful to you, so faithful to you that he, because he knows of the temptations of humanity, has already provided you a proven way for you to escape. I, I never want to catch myself saying, I can't help it. Let's just put this where we live. I can't help it. I couldn't help myself. He can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried beyond your ability and strength of resistance and power to endure. Here's the truth. We can overcome temptation with his help. We can. With his help. I want to add that. With his help. We have the ability. This would make a great confession for us to say over ourselves. There is nothing beyond my ability and strength of resistance and power. There's nothing. There's nothing. What if we got up and said that every day? There's nothing beyond my ability and strength of resistance and power to endure because he has provided the way, the means of escape. So when temptation comes, I want us to think about something. Somewhere in the middle of that temptation and all that's going on in your head, God's got an escape door. There's something there. A thought's going to come to you. Something's going to rise up out of your spirit. And, and, and a, a, a scripture that you heard when you were a child or a scripture, a song that you heard somebody sing, something's going to, there's going to be little something come up in the middle of that temptation that's where you gravitate to right there because that's your way that's your way and this comes down to thoughts it's the way he tempted Adam and Eve it's the way he tempted Christ it's the way he's going to tempt you through your thoughts so when all those thoughts start coming and sometimes some of those temptations involve our flesh cravings or, or desires and so when all of that's going on I want you to think, somewhere in here, there is an escape door that he has pre-built into every single temptation that the enemy can bring. There is nothing that there's not an escape from. We can, we can do this. We, can, we only need one way out. It's not like we need a gazillion ways out. We only need one way out. Just give me that way. And he says he will. He's faithful to it. Therefore, my dearly beloved, shun, keep clear away from, avoid by flight if need be. I love that. Any sort of idolatry of loving or venerating anything more than God. I am speaking as to intelligent, sensible men. Think over and make up your minds for yourselves about what I say. I appeal to your reason and your discernment in these matters. He just wants you to think. He wants you to think soberly about this and to realize he's faithful. I've heard people misquote that scripture and almost turn it on God. God will not put more on me than I can bear. No, he said he wouldn't allow the enemy to put more on you than you. There is a limit to, to the access that the enemy has to humanity. Jesus covered every one of those accesses on the cross. Every one of them. Jesus made a way for us for anything that the, the devil could attack us with. Jesus provided a way in, in any of them. So I like to put it this way. There's nothing God has not prepared a way out of. Not that... He's just going to load us down to the breaking point but not put that last straw one that will take us down. Look, if that was true, suicide wouldn't happen. Because in suicide, something more than they could bear was put on them. And if God did that, I don't, I don't care about serving him. But God made a way of escape. He made a way of escape. Some people break under the pressure so we know that, that when people say God won't put on more of us than we can bear, we know that's not true. That doesn't make sense. We've got to be reading that wrong. Go with me to Hebrews 12. I 
I like this one because it balances my head. Hebrews 12, verse 3. It says, just think of him, Jesus, who endured from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself. Reckon up and consider it all in comparison with your trials. As bad as you think it is, as bad as I think it is, as bad as I think what's happening to me is, he wants me to compare it to something, what Jesus went through. And man, does that kind of balance things out for me. Why? Why does he want you to compare it to that? So that you may not grow weary or exhausted, losing heart and relaxing and fainting in your minds. Now, he just gave us some really big keys right there to overcoming temptation. You can't start relaxing with it. You can't let up. You can't let up the pressure that you're putting on that temptation. You can't let up. What happens when I let up? I fall into it. Sometimes jump into it. Don't grow weary, exhausted. Don't lose heart. Don't relax. Don't faint in your minds. You've got to stay sharp. He's not saying that overcoming temptation is easy, but he's saying it can be done. So we've got to stay on. And these are the things we've got to watch for in each other, especially if we know each other's weaknesses, which I think we're learning a little bit more to do in the body of Christ. It's not wrong to know somebody has a weakness. It's wrong to know it and not help them. But as we know each other and learn each other, we've got to make sure people don't get exhausted, especially in long, enduring fights over temptation. We've got to keep people built up. We've got to keep each other built up. We've got to keep ourselves built up. If there's nobody else to build me up, I can build myself up. The Scripture says build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. There's ways we can keep ourselves built up and from being exhausted. I, I'm going to use something even natural here because I think the Scripture backs it up. Exercise is great for your brain. Nature is great for you. Fresh air is great for our brains. There are things we can do to keep ourselves sharp, to keep ourselves from, from losing heart, relaxing, fainting in our minds. Verse 4, You have not yet struggled and fought agonizingly against sin, nor have you yet resisted and withstood to the point of pouring out your own blood. There you go. I've, I've fought the weight thing and fought the weight thing, and I can say I've done everything. I've done everything I know to do. I have yet not strived to pouring out my own blood. And God just kind of ends all my little pity parties and ends all my excuses, and he says, here you go. You, you haven't strived to that point. No, you haven't. But Jesus did. He did so I don't have to. He did so I don't have to. He let his victory be my victory. He let me walk in his life instead of in my death. And when we begin to, to see ourselves in Christ, we begin to see ourselves strong instead of weak. You were weak. Now you're strong. Why? Because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of you. That changes everything. It's no longer about you. It's no longer about you being able to beat this. It's about you becoming aware of the one who did. And you so associating with him, well, you just won't be able to see yourself lose anymore. And that's when you, that's when you find victory. not just you anymore I've lost to this and I've lost to this and I've always I've always keep falling in this. it's not just you anymore we got to get our eyes off ourselves and get our eyes on the answer you've partnered with the one who walked without sin he's your partner and it wasn't that he wasn't tempted he was tempted Matthew 4 Jesus was led by the spirit in the wilderness and was tempted by the devil after 40 fasting 40 days and 40 nights he was hungry the tempter came to him and said if you're the son of God tell these stones to become bread why did he tempt him with that well you go 40 days and 40 nights without eating anything and tell me turning stones to bread is not tempting he tempted him with it because he knew that it would be a temptation. 
Look, there's certain things that the enemy doesn't tempt me with going down to rob the bank. He just doesn't. That's just never a thought that he brings, brings to me. He, he tempts me in ways that he knows are tempting to me. And that's what he was doing with Jesus right here. The devil himself said, hey, this guy's been without food for 40 days and 40 nights. Turn the stone to bread. And Jesus answered, oh no, it's written. See, Eve didn't have complete knowledge of what God said. Jesus did. He's fixing to show the devil. I know what God said, and I'm not altering it. What God came out of God's lips, I'm not weakening it at all. And that shuts the door to him. He says, it's written, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, he's always questioning who you are. If you're a Christian, why? If you're a Christian, you better know who you are. Jesus knew who he was. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it's written, oh wait, the devil's going to quote scripture to me now? Really? That's what he's doing right here. He's quoting scriptures to, to the word of God. He's quoting scriptures to Jesus. And he said, is it not written? He's going to try to beat Jesus as his own game here. That he'll command his angels concerning you, and they'll lift you up in their hands so that you won't strike your foot against a stone? Throw yourself down and let's just, you know, prove the word is true. Mm, Jesus said, it's written. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I'll give you, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me. Away from me, Satan, for it is written... Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. He endured. He endured. And he beat it. So with every temptation, he had a prepared answer. And that prepared answer was the word of God. That's your prepared answer. You need to get in there. You need to know the word. You need to know what it says about you. You need to know who it says you are and, and who you are in Christ Jesus. So when the tempter comes and he says, if you are... You have an answer. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. His righteousness was not earned by me. It was a gift to me. You can't shame me anymore, Satan, over the things I've done. I've been bought with a price. And when you can come back with confidence, you're not faking the devil out, making him think you're something that you're not. You know who you are. And when you come back with that confidence, you win. With every temptation, he had a prepared answer. He said what God said. Adam's sin was silence. Y'all hear me say that a lot around here. Adam's sin was silence. The enemy came to tempt. Eve was deceived. At, the scripture says Adam was not. And he said nothing. He listened to the temptation and it conceived sin. We can't be silent when temptation comes. We need to speak, and we need to say what the Word says. But where Adam failed in the garden, Jesus succeeded in the desert. Adam had perfect situation around him and failed. Jesus had an imperfect situation around him and succeeded. It's all about the Word. But because of Jesus, you have the same Holy Spirit that walked with Jesus into that desert and through that temptation he is no less in you than he was in Christ. I know that's hard for us. We want to see a, a watered down everything when it comes to us. Not true. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. The same one that walked into that desert temptation with Jesus and guided him through it, brought the word of God to his remembrance for him to speak is the same Holy Spirit that will walk with you through your temptation. Same spirit, no different. Never forget the humanity of Christ. Never forget the humanity of Jesus. This is the beautiful thing. This is what sets our Savior apart. Philippians Two? It's either Philippians 2 or Philippians 4. It says that he emptied himself of his deity power and he came into the earth as a mere man. Why? To show me how. To show me what it looks like. 
for a human being filled with the Holy Spirit of God to walk through this earth influenced by the Father God. Jesus showed us perfectly and he showed us that it could be done. He did it without sin. Hebrews 4.15 so beautiful to me because we all want to be understood. And when the enemy makes us feel alone in our temptation, he makes us feel like nobody gets us. And, and I've even said it before, you know, in, in the things that I deal with of, of having lost Wade, is I, I, sometimes I feel, other than other moms who have lost children, I feel alone, like you don't understand. And that's the way the enemy wants us to feel. No, you don't understand. God does. I think, think he gave up a child. So you, we can't walk through places and feel alone when we have a Savior who walked this earth as a man and was tempted like us. Hebrews 4.15 states that. He says, For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. You know what that tells me? He gets me. He gets me. And that, that makes him a beautiful savior to me. It's not that he was God who came down here and walked as God. He was God who walked down here as a man. A man like you. And so when he says, I get you. I mean, I can say I get you, but Jesus says, I get you. That means something to me. He gets our weakness. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Not only did he walk down here as a man, he was tempted in all ways like we are, the same stupid devil, the same kinds of thoughts, the same kinds of thought patterns that the enemy, the deceit he tries to use on you, tried to use on Jesus. And yet Jesus walked through it without sin. So he's this perfect example for us. But I think most importantly to me, what helps me is that he gets it. He gets it. He wants to help me because he gets it. He knows how to help me because he gets it. Verse 16, because of that, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. So we're not like Adam and Eve having to hide ourselves behind a tree here with sown fig leaves. Behind, from a holy God. We have a high priest who gets it. And therefore, confidently, I can come to the throne of grace. Not the throne of judgment. Yes, he's a God of judgment. There's coming a day. But for you, you get to come to the throne of grace. Why? Because you need help we need help that's how he finishes it and we that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need that is one of the most beautiful passages of scripture in your bible i love that passage so approach with confidence man don't try to fight this on your own i don't care how big or how small that temptation is don't be alone because if you're alone you're on your own strength but if you're with him you've got his strength and I love how he, how he answered Paul when Paul was begging remember the messenger of Satan had come to buffet Paul and it was harassing Paul and Paul said I keep three times God I've asked you to take this from me have we ever done that God just take this from me take it from me and God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Get after it. I've given you my grace. Get after this. You can do this. My grace is sufficient for you. So, you know, it's, it's not over just because you haven't been able to handle it. Just because you couldn't handle it before doesn't mean you're always going to fall into it. it it's, it's not just about your strength anymore. We've got to lean heavy. We've got to use the tools that he's given us. And, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I've already been a long time. Man, prayer. When it talks about confidently coming to the throne of grace, talk to God. Well, I don't know how to pray. Talk. 
That's how you pray. Let's, let's not make this what it's not. He's your father. If you needed something and you had a good father, you go to your father and say, Dad, what do I do here? And your dad would tell you. The scripture says God's the same way. He said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. He'll give it to him. He won't hold anything back and he won't make you feel bad for asking. That's Susan version of it. He'll help you. He wants to help you. He's there to help you. So lean on it. Prayer is talking to God. Talk to him. He asks you to come to his throne with confidence. Don't forget about praise. The power of praise. Look, if temptation is a fight for your mind and the temptation is going on in the mind, we have to control the mind. One of the best ways for me to control my mind is praise. Because if I'm praising, it's putting my focus on God. It's taking my focus off the temptation. So whether I'm, you know, and I, of course I have down the word. The word is a strength. There's an anointing on the word. Don't forget about the anointing that's on the word. Say the scripture over yourself. There's an anointing on that word. It's God's word. It's not just you speaking words. It's you speaking God's word. So it's got God's authority and his power and his anointing behind it. Speak the word, sing the word, use praise and worship, use those things to control your mind. And of course, use each other. Surround yourself by people who will encourage you and who will build you up and who will help you in the fight. There are times that we have to protect ourselves. There's times I can be around anybody. But there are times that I go into a shelter and I'm very picky about who's around me during those times because I've got to build myself up. Choose wisely. Amen? We can do this. We can do it. It's been done. It's proven. And a way's been made. Amen? Look for that escape door. Y'all can stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.